Thanks for tuning in to Stay Sharp with Razorleaf, your secret weapon for all things digital and products and manufacturing. When RFPs, which stands for Requests for Proposals, are found in a salesperson's inbox, they're often met with a dual response. First, they're happy to be included in the solicitation, but they also get a heavy sigh when it comes to coordinating a response. RFPs are a common approach for organizations to solicit bids from multiple vendors on solving a particular business problem. In this episode, Derek Needing is joined with Jen and Jonathan to discuss the good, bad, and the ugly when it comes to creating and responding to RFPs. Derek outlines some of the key challenges and shortcomings with RFPs. Let's listen in and make sure your next RFP bid process is successful. Welcome back, everybody, to Stay Sharp, the podcast about all things digital as it relates to products and manufacturing. I am joined today by my co-host, Jonathan Scott. Hi, everybody. And Derek Needing. Thank you. Derek was uh, employee number one here at Razorleaf right after our CEO. So he's been he's done a little bit of everything uh, along his career path here at Razorleaf in the last 22, 23 years. Um, he is currently our VP of Business Development and my boss. So he's going to bring a lot to our, our topic today. Um, we spent a lot of time in our podcast talking about technology and the implementation technology, the different types of technology. Um, but really, when you're, when you're going through a digital transformation process, defining the scope of the project, what you're going to do, choosing which technology to bring to bear, and then who best to help you implement that is actually a process every bit as complex as the technology itself. Um, and a large part of whether or not your digital transformation is going to be successful. Um, so one of the most, uh, let's, we're going to dig in a little bit to one of the most common methods of going through that process, scoping and the selection, and it's called RFP or RFQ. So to re- request for proposal or request for quote. Um, and, you know, I, again, Derek, having had a lot of experience on both the services and the uh, sales side of things, and Jonathan, of course, on experience in all of these things. Uh, let's dig into that a little bit. So Derek, we, we usually start off with kind of defining what that is and why people might use it in general. So you want to start us off there? Sure. So um, we, we, we tend to see RFPs, we'll use the term RFP, RFP, RFQ generally are pretty interchangeable. We use the term RFP for most of this, I, I would think. Um, yeah, and sometimes you get the the odd RFI thrown in there to extend the process too, right? Yeah. Sure. I'm going to yeah. ask for clarification yeah. on that. What is RFI? Request Re- for information, ah. right? So it's like a, a preceding step before you figure out who you're going to send the RFP to. Yeah, can just, yeah. you know, I mean, and sometimes it makes sense, but it can draw the process out. Anyway, sorry, I digress. Derek. So so we, we tend to see them in, um, we tend to see them more commonly in, in, in larger proposals. Um just because of the uh, the investment, I, I think that the, the company wants maybe a little more protection or a little bit more clarity on what they're doing, a little more competitive bid. Uh, although that's not to say we don't see them on smaller, shorter term projects. But uh, the, the idea is pretty simple. Um, it's usually owned, generated, kind of overseen by procurement, by purchasing, while a lot of the content would come from the technical team, the engineering team or the manufacturing team, the people that are actually using the software, defining the requirements. A lot of times it's kind of the process is owned by procurement. And the idea is let's put our requirements down in something that is uh, uh, readable and understandable by the vendors, by the bidders. We'll send it out to a group of bidders. I think a lot of times there is a... um, a goal to send it out to as many bidders as possible, and uh, and let's get uh, replies back. Those replies uh, include um, our approach to solving your problem, um, the the way we're going to run your project, uh, our experience in doing similar things, and then obviously the cost that it would that it would take to do that project. the The goal, I think, from the the client's perspective is to hope to get an apples-to-apples comparison of the different approaches from different uh, potential vendors or different potential SIs. Um, They also hope these SIs, knowing that they're in a competitive situation, will tend to be pretty aggressive with pricing. Uh, Usually it's expected that when you reply to an RFP that the price that you put in that RFP is your best and final offer. 
versus if it was a one-on-one -on -one sort of situation, um, I may provide a price to the client. He may come back to me. There's a little bit of negotiation. We see if we can maybe change the scope or change the price or change the schedule, all of those sort of things. With an RFP, that's generally not the expectation. It is, here is my offer, and this is the best and final offer. In fact, oftentimes RFPs will have language that say that the offer that you are presenting is actually contractually binding should we accept the offer. Uh, so from that perspective, the, I think the customer um, is, is hoping to get that apple to apples comparison, an aggressive quote, and also um, a common way of understanding how each vendor will, um, will approach their project. And to your point, maybe also a shortened timeline, right? That, hey, once we pick the one we want, we're done. There's no negotiation. There's no Price fun. has it's been just, defined. Price yeah, has been defined. Right. Team has been defined. Right. That's right. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. It does seem like it would save time and money because you're basically, you've defined the scope. Hey, I've, this is what I need. You guys are, you know, you're, it, whether it's two or five or eight to 10 vendors that you're sending it out to, this is what I want. Tell me what, what you can do for me. That's right. And, and it's, it's, it's believed, and in many cases it is, it's believed to be a fair, a fair process. Um, you, you think about the scenario where maybe I had a relationship with a customer for many years and we were doing work together and we get to the point where there's a, a significant project, a large project, for whatever reason, procurement wants to send it out through RFP um, uh, or for, for other competitive bids. But I've got this really deep long-term relationship with the customer, you know, do I start getting inside information? Do I kind of know, um, you know, how they digest things? So I'm going to present my proposal in a different way. And whereas the other competitive vendors, they don't have that knowledge. And so the company procurement, others are worried that I have a leg up and, uh, and maybe that leg up is good, but in some cases, maybe it's not, maybe I am using that leg up to to you know, have my price be a little bit higher, or to to push a slightly different approach than than my competitors, and so it, it's it's believed to kind of level the playing field for everybody involved because we're all bidding on the same thing. In fact, it's not uncommon; it's probably the norm. I would say that an RFP um, actually often has a structure to your reply, uh, sometimes to the point of three paragraphs for this. Two paragraphs for this. You have to have this section. It has to be in this order, this many pages. We've seen them that dictate the font and the spacing um, because, again, they, they don't want someone to have some sort of advantage. They want it to be a very fair and very consistent reply. To, yeah. to that point, Derek, I want to ask a question. Do you, what, what your opinion on this, do you think that RFPs typically yield a consistency in reply? Right? Forget the formatting stuff, right? Not that, but... Do you, I mean, do you think it actually accomplishes that, that most of the time people are getting a consistency are they, in answers? Are they answering the question or is it more like a pres presidential debate where they answer the question they want to answer? <laughs> <laughs> so, so let me go back to something I said earlier, which I said oftentimes RFPs are used for larger or more complex projects. And in that case, I would say, no, you don't get the results you want. If, if the project is smaller and the project is very focused and very, very defined, there's only one way to do what you're asking to be done. And you just want to know the price for, you know, competitor A, B and C to do it. Then, yeah, you probably are getting very consistent replies. But in the cases where the project is complex, lengthy, um, expensive, different vendors are going to have different approaches. And, and to say that, you know, let's take an RFP that is a, a, a new implementation of software. And so one of the phases is installation of, of server uh, components. Um, you know, each vendor may have a different approach that they do that with. One vendor may have tools that they've developed or processes they, they've developed um, to do it in a certain way. And another vendor has a, a slightly different approach. Another vendor uses a third party partner to help with that sort of stuff. And, and so because of that, you know, I don't think you you can get um, some of the consistency that you would hope because each vendor has a different level of experience and each vendor has a different approach on how they do that. And um, so when you see the replies, while you may think it's an apples to apples comparison, um, it, it's, it's often not. The other thing is... But before that, you go on, Derek, I, that's a really interesting point, the, what you drew there about the smaller the project and the simpler the project, the more likely you get kind of a side-by-side -side comparison because right. it's, it's easier to be clear about exactly what you want. There aren't as many possibilities and variants, that kind of thing. But the larger the project, the opposite is true. I just, that's a, I think a valuable conclusion for people to, to hear out of today. Right. I'm sorry, right. go ahead. Right. 
Yeah. And so um, what I was going to say is the, the other thing that that can happen is those those replies that come in are being um, and this is not I hope this doesn't sound, um, you know, like I'm putting down the, the, the customer. But how often is the customer doing a multi-million dollar, multi-month upgrade once in right. their career? A, a couple right, times right. in their career, maybe. And so they're reading these replies from vendors and they're they're assuming that they completely understand what that paragraph means, what that step means, what that scope definition means. And in reality, they they may really not know what they're reading. So, so when they read this statement in RFP1 and they read this statement in RFP2, they're like, oh yeah, that's the same thing. They're doing the same thing. Meanwhile, slight changes in wording, slight changes in, in, in duration, slight changes in, in order of operation could really change what, what's being said here. And this is the only you know multi-month, multi-million dollar upgrade you're ever going to do in your life. And you're supposed to well, know Derek, that when you, when you read this and digest it. Derek, that works both ways too, though, right? I mean, the, the point you're making about the imperfection of written communication, right? Particularly English. <laughs> we, we all do English, but we all know English is not always simple um, and clear and, and unambiguous and all those things. So to your point, the the customer reading the responses may understand the different responses differently, even though they're trying to do apples to apples. But on the front end of that, it's just as likely, and you know, I'm speaking from experience here, that different vendors responding to an RFP read the RFP document itself differently, right? Let's go a step further, Jonathan. D- different individuals within the same vendor. Yes. Right. The right. I mean, we've been on this ourselves, right? Where where yeah. I get an RFP and I ask you and your team for help and, and they say, well, we're going to do this. And I'm like, well, why would you do it that way? Well, it says this. I'm like, that's not what it says. Like, yeah, that right. is what it says. That's not what they meant. <laughs> no, I'm sure that's what they meant. So even within the same company, we sometimes can't agree on what, what the definition is. Or That's exactly right. Or how to reply, right? Like, well, what, well, they didn't put this, this, and this in it. Well, they didn't ask for that. Well, yeah, but we know that this which ends up driving up price and complexity and things like that. But that's right. But before we, we get to that, I want to I want to dig back into the RFP itself. So like one of the things, you know, as you were talking about um, transparency in the process and getting apples to apples, one of the things I know from going through RFP processes is the um, the question and answer piece of it, which mm-hmm. you know where you know if you're working with an individual to develop the scope of a project. It's, it's very much back and forth and you're working s- specifically with them or their team versus in an RFP process, every question that you ask and every answer that they, you get back goes to everyone, right? So that's right. Sometimes that, that's a good point to make, right? I mean, as we're defining what an RFP right? process looks like, some RFPs, it's exactly that. I mean, because the goal is to be fair and get the apples to apples, right? Other RFPs aren't as focused on the fair part as much as the competitive part, right? I mean, I, I feel like that's the case. I mean, you guys can tell me what you think, but sometimes those questions don't get answered publicly. It's you ask a question and the person says, okay, I'll answer your question. And they don't share it with all the other parties. And anyway, I just wanted to be clear about that because I don't think it happens true. all I mean, the time. All, yeah, there, there are always exceptions. Yeah, I think I think that's right, Jonathan. I, but I would also say that, that, so we've been involved in RFPs that were both both ways. Where right. you know there was a mm-hmm. there was a question period, and once all the questions were submitted, they were all answered to all parties. All you know, questions were re- re- relayed to all parties, and answers were relayed to all parties. Um, we've been in cases where that that's not the case, um, and we've been in cases where we don't know what's going to happen when we submit our question, <laughs> and that actually changes the way we approach the RFP, which right. is sometimes unfortunate for the receiver of that R the R reply. Because we may actually choose not to ask a question because we believe it's a competitive advantage to our reply. Let, let, me, let me give you an example. So the, um, the customer has requirement X within their RFP. The re- let's assume the requirement is very clear on what it needs to, to be. So there's not, not a lot of ambiguity there. And it, it, my organization, because of our experience and because of the things we've done in the past, we know that there's a third-party component tool software that will serve requirement X very, very well, um, perfectly. Um, so one of the questions I might ask is, is using a third-party component allowed as part of our reply? Right. But then I think, 
well, if I, what if my competitors don't know so much about the third party component? And they, so they're going to they're going to bid requirement X by saying, well, it's going to take us this much time to customize and this much time to do that. And it's going to mm-hmm. inflate their their scope, their cost, their timeline. And so I may choose not to ask that question. And because I don't want my question to go out to all of the, the bidders and the bidders get the answers back and they say, oh, we can use th- there, there must someone asked about third party components. There must be something in here where we could use a third-party component. And they start scrubbing the RFP, and they find that place. And now, so, um, I, and I have to think that way because my goal in replying to the RFP is to try to win the RFP. And so I have to think, how can I have a competitive advantage over my counter, over those that are, that are bidding against me? Here's, here's one of the things that we have to remember. And this may not be true in every industry, but in the digital engineering, manufacturing industry that we're in today, there is no silver bullet out there. There is no right. magical what? thing that what? someone has come up with that makes them able to upgrade, implement, um, you know, roll out new functionality of your system 10 times faster than anybody else. So at the end of the day, the price is gonna be effort times rate equals price. It's very simple algebra. And so um, when, when, when I'm looking at that RFP, I'm looking at ways that I can reduce effort. So, you know, if you get RFP replies back, and maybe we're getting a little off topic here, but if you get RFPs reply back and, and one is a million and a half dollars and the next one is uh, 500,000, and you say, well, 500,000, that's, that's a lot better than a million and a half, the scope isn't the same. It's not. Right. It's it's just that simple. <laughs> but it's supposed to be, right? I mean, that's that's where we're that's where we're starting. So, I mean, when you when you have an, an RFP, the the customer defines what they want, and then they say, and they put it out there and say, okay, this is the this is what we want. This is the timeline we want. This is how we want you to bid it. Go ahead and ask any questions, okay? And then sends those either accepts those and replies to you directly or accepts them and then replies to everyone and then makes a selection based on the results. So it's supposed to be the same yeah. scope and you're supposed to be answering the same question. So I yeah. guess like, how does it get so different? How do the responses get so different? It's because of what Jonathan said earlier, because there's still interpretation even within mm-hmm. those requirements. So, now, that's not true of every requirement. There are some requirements that are very black and white, and it's very clear on what needs to happen. That may be a, a lot of the RFP. But any cases where there is, there is room for interpretation, someone has to interpret, and you have to assume that your bidders all interpreted the same way, therefore their reply is consistent. So if you need a piece of functionality... Um, you know, the bidder A reply in a way where he's going to solve that need in a very automated, very smooth, very seamless approach. And bidder B replied in a way where he's going to solve it as cheap as possible, even though it's less automated, requires a little more user interaction, a little more user checking. You know, they're, they're both going to solve the requirement, but is one going to solve it differently than the other one? And that's where it, it's, you know, and I don't know what what the prospect or the customer is hoping for. Are they hoping for something that's very automated, impossible to break? Or are they hoping for something that meets the requirement as cheap as possible? Well, it, to that point, Derek, I mean, it's hard to understand what somebody else means through the written word. It's also hard just through words alone, right? And to your point about the the sort of sterility of the process means that you might not know the person on the other end. So when it's time for interpretation, you don't know how to interpret them. You don't know them. You don't don't have have a relationship with them, right? You don't have a context to interpret, which is, I think, part of what leads to all these interpretations. Like you said, if all you've got to go off of is the words on the page, you and I might be on the same team and we read it differently, much less vendor B, vendor C, vendor D. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and it's, it's also, you know, this goes back to that kind of competitive nature of the RFP. I mean, it's competitive by design, but I know that as someone who's replying to the RFP, I know it's competitive by design. And so, and again, a lot of these RFPs are big, big projects, a, a great opportunity for my organization to win this. We would love to win it, you know, keeps us busy. Um, it helps with revenue, all that sort of stuff. So we want to be competitive. 
And so there are cases where there is a requirement in RFP that is open for interpretation. And I will say we could ask some clarifying questions, but the answers to those clarifying questions may come back that make us have to bid very, very high because they've answered it in a certain way. I don't want to do that. I want to be able to bid low. So my interpretation of this question is valid. I'm not doing anything underhanded. It is a valid interpretation. Let me just stick with my interpretation. Instead of asking yeah. clarifying questions, let me stick with my interpretation because that will allow me to bid this as low as possible. And I want to bid as low as possible because I know it's competitive. I was going to say, so that's an interesting point. Just the, basically by defining, or, or the interpretation allows you to, your focus is on, on winning, obviously, because you want to win the bid. And by how you interpret it, I don't, I'm not quite sure how I want to ask this question. It, basically, you're framing your response to win it. It's like you said, it's not, um, it's not wrong. It's not incorrect the way you're doing it, but it's not necessarily digging in as deep because that might jack the price up and you don't, and that would hurt you. It might be the most honest thing for the customer, but the customer, because the focus of RFPs is often to keep the budget down. Mm -hmm. But as a result, they, they're basically scoping that out. Would that be correct? Is it? I, I think that's that's exactly right. I mean, the yeah. response is you're looking for the cheapest response so that you can win it, but it's right. not but necessarily it's, the most complete response. Yeah. So I think what I'm hearing you say is, you know, there's two ways to respond to to something, right? You can respond with a question, which is sort of, you know, responding openly to all competitors who who might be interested in what you have to say and might inform what they have to say and that sort of thing. Or you can respond privately, right, to something that maybe is ambiguous. And rather than ask the question, you can assert your answer, right? So, so to your point, I mean, it's not to be unethical, but it's just saying, look, I can respond to something that's not clear by asking for clarification for all of us or by offering you how I interpreted it right. in just a response directly to you. And it makes perfect sense, right? Because to the point you were making, Jen, and I think, Derek, this is where you're headed, is what you're trying to do is continue the conversation, right? right? What you're trying to do is say, look, you've asked me how I can solve your problem, and I believe I can solve your problem, but your requirements were not all 100% concise and clear. It's not as simple as giving you a price. I need to talk with you. I need to tell you there are options. I need to say you could do it this way. But in order to continue the conversation, I believe I have to be lowest bidder. So yeah, and Jonathan, we, this is how I'm responding. We've right? actually seen RFPs. And so let's talk a little bit about some of the good, good things we've seen with RFPs, right? We've seen RFPs right. where the reply is dictated, you know, this format, this structure, here's what you need to include, but they allow you to provide an alternate reply. So give right. us your reply. So I have my apples to apples, but then did we miss something? Do you have a different approach? Should we be thinking about this differently? You can go ahead and, and provide that as well. And we and we really like that because that allows us to be consultative within our reply. So here's our reply that matches your template and your structure that you've given us. And now we're going to go off that a little bit. And we're going to tell you that we really don't think that's the right order to do stuff in. We would do it this mm -hmm. way instead. We don't think you should be thinking of it this way. We think you should be thinking of it that way. So that that's actually... Those are enjoyable to get those RFPs because, it, again, it allows us to be problem solvers, not just, um, you know, checking boxes and answering very black and white sort of questions. This, this, by the way, is why I interrupted at the beginning and mentioned RFI. Right. Right. Because I believe when we get that in an RFP, honestly, that's what people are trying to do. Right. And not everybody has the same understanding of all these processes and that sort of thing. But to me, that's what a request for information is. Is it saying, I'm going out to the market. I'm not asking for the best price. I'm not trying to make a decision right now. What I am trying to do is understand who I want to talk to. Right. I want to understand who's got ideas that they're willing to share with me. And I'm not, you know, it's not a, a best and final, you got to get it in or I'm not going to talk to you anymore kind of situation. Therefore, people will write information. They'll, they'll answer openly, right? And they won't be concerned about, well, if I don't get the lowest, then I'm out of the discussion. Right. Right. And I think that's... But to your point, sometimes that's in an RFP and that's confusing. Yeah. But I mean, if they, I can, I can see the real advantage of having that, that type of um, end of an RFP basically saying, okay, now, and what do you think? Because the, mm -hmm. I think right. one of the real challenges of RFPs is the, the customer is developing 
the scope of what they want, what they need, but they don't necessarily know all of what they want and all of what they need because this is not their business. Digital transformation is not their business or PLM implementations is not their business. So they don't know the ins and outs and the all the different questions. Well, do you want to do it this way? Do you want to do it that way? So that that I think is probably one of the real downsides of RFPs is that the scope is defined in a vacuum, in the customer's vacuum, and not necessarily with all of the knowledge that you know a, an experienced provider can bring to the question. Right. We probably should have an economist on to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 when you were saying that, I'm thinking, what's the challenge in that, right? And you think about you know markets and open markets and how they operate freely and that kind of thing. And you know, commodity markets are the most frictionless because everybody knows what they're getting. And that's the thing we're talking about here is what's hard is when not everybody has the same knowledge or understanding. So the buyer maybe is less informed than the vendors and what they're offering because the vendors do it all the time and they're, they're different, they're unique, <clears throat> and it's not a commodity. It's not the same thing, right? If I'm just buying pork bellies or corn or whatever, I know what the thing is. And when I say I want 10,000 of them, it's clear. Right. But when I say I want a digital twin, it's not, it's not clear. clear. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Jen, what, what can happen is you can actually begin to, um, while you think your very specific and detailed requirements are honing us in on the right solution, Mm-hmm. You actually can limit the creativity and the innovation that a smart partner vendor SI could be providing you. Um, they're they're so focused on you've got 90 pages worth of requirements and I have to go through and check the box. And by the way, we've done that. We've got RFPs that are 90 pages long with 172 different requirements in it. And we write our reply and we open up the RFP and we go to requirement number 1.1. We look in our RFP. Check. Requirement 1.2, we look at our RFP, check. And we so you you think that, good, I've got everything I want. But what if we disagreed that requirement 1.2 was necessary? We think there's a different way to do that. So right. um, you guys are familiar with the RFP back in the 1890s that Joseph Fisher sent out, right? You're familiar with this? <laughs> no? Okay. Yeah, I studied okay. it yesterday. Let me, let, me, let me tell you about this RFP. So back in the 1890s, there was a gentleman by the name of Joseph Fisher. He owned a... Um, a transportation company, and um, he needed uh, faster horse and buggies. He had to get faster horse and buggies. So he developed an RFP because he wanted to make sure that he could get the um, the best and the cheapest faster horse and buggies. And so he developed this RFP, and in the RFP, he made sure that the re- re- respondents talked about their uh, equestrian knowledge and experience with uh, horses, and and what will the veterinary care of this uh, team of horses that I'm about to buy from you be, and and what sort of splash guards will you put on the carriage so that when the horse is, is running, it's not kicking up mud and, and snow and, and that sort of stuff. And he put all these requirements in there, and he sent this uh, RFP out, and it happened to land on the desk of Mr. Mr. Henry Ford. And Henry Ford looked at that re- that RFP and he said, I can't reply. I don't have equestrian knowledge. I don't know anything about veterinary. I think I could solve his problem, but I can't reply. And so he didn't reply. And so Mr. Joseph Fisher got his replies back and he chose his path forward based on the cheapest vendor that met his needs. And he completely missed an opportunity to transform the way his business was because there was actually a solution that Mr. Fisher didn't even know about. But because of the, the, the rigid and sterile nature of the RFP process, he didn't even get the reply. So that's- it. Derek, is that a real story? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. it's, it's a good analogy though. Like I don't, I don't if, if you go back to our podcast about what is PLM, I'm not sure that you know, the cavemen actually use PLM. Processes, but right. you know it is that's a good true. analogy. That's true, and it's no stories are the best because that was a great yeah. story. It's a great point. Well, and I think what it really focused on is in an RFP process, the customer is defining the solution. They're not defining the problem that they're having or the problem that they want to solve, and asking, right. "How would you solve this?" They're saying, "What, these, if, what if this? These are the aspects of the solution. Can you that's meet?" Right. What, what if Mister Fisher's RFP would have been, "I have this business problem that I need to solve." give me some creative ideas, price, scope, all that sort of stuff on solving my business problem. And so his business problem was I'm growing. I have more deliveries. We can't get across across town fast enough when the weather's bad, when the horses are sick. That's his business problem. 
And right. Mr. Ford could have replied with, I've got something that you've maybe not thought of, but I think it solves your business problem. Yeah. It, it points out something interesting about the whole process, the whole transaction though, right? Which is, like I was saying a minute ago with my you know economist and commodity thing, is the buyer doesn't necessarily have a great understanding of the whole space. They, they understand their problem, like you said, Derek. And if they try not to oversolve themselves and, and do the solution themselves, they may get more interesting answers. Mm-hmm. But then the other piece is they do have to be willing to invest their time to understand those answers because it's not just the, the solution. It's actually, you need the person who's providing the solution to explain it. It's back to that RFI part, That's right? right? Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I need to know not just what, what you're saying, like Mr. Ford, that's an interesting idea, an internal combustion. Tell me about I've it. never heard of that. Right. right. Tell me about it. Right. What, why? What are the benefits of that to my business problem? Right. But it, it, now we're, we're way off track in terms of an RFP sometimes, because if you're trying to be efficient, if you're trying to be competitive, it's like, well, no, you, it's a different thing. If you're looking for information to see how good of a fit the solution is to your problem, you're now you're looking at, it's a different transaction. Right. I think. It is a different yeah. transaction, but it's it's an interesting because it's basically where are you investing your time, because it's or your your resources because it's if you do more of that back and forth up front, you're going to come up with a better solution that might have a slightly higher price tag as well than if you'd gone through the RFP process. But if you go through the RFP process and you get rote answers to what you've defined as the problem and the lowest cost provider, and you end up without, without the solution that you want. And now you have to go back and do it again. Right. Absolutely. Right. It's, it's a question of what are you trying to optimize? And there's also probably a confidence question here too. If you are confident that you know exactly what you're looking for and you can state it clearly, then an RFP could help you get the best price and that makes sense. But if you're not sure that you understand the business problem and the best possible solution to it, and you're just looking for the best price, then to your point, Jen, you might have to go through it multiple times. You might buy the thing at the best price, but it wasn't the right thing. It wasn't the best thing. And now you've bought two things or three things. Well, two and more. Jonathan, that, that actually um, it can, is sometimes a strategy of, of those that are replying to the RFP is the idea that we'll reply to the letter of the law we will, and, you know, and, and we know this isn't what they want. We know this isn't what they need. Let's say need. We don't know. We know this isn't what they need. There's a different way to do this. But what this is what they asked for, so we're going to reply. And then when we get in, we'll just write change orders. But they'll just have to write right. change orders. And so now I, I've, I've, I've selected the lowest cost vendor that I think is capable of meeting my needs. And he comes in. And then meanwhile, after we start putting change order on top of change order, schedule slips, cost slips, all those things start to happen. And, you know, it, it, it was unavoidable um, the way that we required the replies that come in. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it's funny because it maybe then the project turns out the way that the vendor thought it was anyway. It just took longer and a lot more change order transactions to get there. And that's right? never fun. And it's not good for a relationship. It's not good for the project. Well, but you know what's interesting about that? I, I think there are some customers... And this is this is a little bit sad, right? Because is sort of cynical about this industry of of consulting that we work in. I believe there are some customers that put out an RFP and go through this process fully expecting that that it's actually just the way they transact business. Mm-hmm. That it is okay. I'm going to go out. I think I know the solution. I'm going to ask for the bids. I'm going to go with the lowest bidder. But I know they're going to change order because I didn't get it right. I, I know I didn't get it right. right. But you know, maybe because of regulatory requirements or some other reason. I have to do RFPs, but I don't expect RFPs to get me what I want. I expect them to be the starting point to get me what I want. And then change orders, that's just a way of formally interacting and helping me understand what I really wanted. And Jonathan, we've worked with those customers before. We tend to see them a little bit more on the government side or the aerospace side, uh, some of these more formal. And you sit in a conference room with them and you say, guys, the RFP, our reply, here's the requirement, but here's where we're at. And they say, yeah, you know, you're right. Yeah, give us a change order. Well, they, and they understand that. So so yeah. that's good, right? They understand that the RFP is the starting point for selecting a vendor based on, um, you know, rate, a vendor based on experience and that sort of thing. But it's not necessarily this is the entire cost of the project. When it's scary, though, is when they don't see it that way. 
And, Correct. and so now there's there's arguments and there's discussions and there's relationships that are that are starting to falter because I'm telling them I answered requirement one dot one. This is what it says. But now you're telling me you want it slightly differently. And and they believe that what one dot one said was exactly what they wanted. But, you know, now we're getting into this. What does English mean? Well, th- that's the tough part, right? That's where <laughs> lots of relationships have trouble is when there's misunderstandings. Right. And to your point, there's change orders to two different people, two different companies understand change orders in two different ways. One company says, well, that's the nature of a not 100 percent clear and informed transaction. So that's what we do. We we change order to fix it over time as we go. No problems. Yeah. Another customer says change order. Well, that's because people weren't listening or that's because you're trying to trick me. And, you know, it's a very different dynamic. And that little misunderstanding, yeah, makes a big difference. Well, and I think what I'm hearing you both say is, you know, and we, we mentioned earlier the, the word context. It's, it's also that the RFP process is, it's a very formal, very largely inflexible approach to answering questions versus when, you're, when you dig in a little bit deeper. So it's basically, it's impersonal, right? So you don't have a, and that's what it's kind of protecting at, is, is you're not using relationships, but when you don't have relationships, you're also not getting the fuller view of the context of not just like what did they mean in the RFP, but how do they feel about change orders? Is it part of the usual process? I mean, that's not something you would ask in an RFP response, I wouldn't think. Hey, how right. do you feel about change orders? Do you want like, do you want us to low bid it and then change order you to death? I don't think that's something you would include. But it is a, it is part like if you have a relationship with someone, you can say, hey, look. These things happen. What, which is more important here? Do you want to get started and then realize that we don't know everything and it's, there may be additional cost? Or do you want, us, you want the full breadth of our expertise and to know up front, yeah, it's going to cost more than you want? Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the impersonal nature of it is, is often by design. In fact, we, you know, we've seen RFPs where sure. our reply allows us to give a little overview of our organization, but it's limited to two paragraphs. You know, they don't want any more than that. And, and they even, you know, we've even seen RFPs that had language that said, you know, within your technical requirements, don't try to slip in experience and, <laughs> and pedigree sort of stuff. I mean, it's actually said that, you know, we'll, we'll see right through that. Um, just stick to the technical requirements. It's designed to be impersonal because, again, it, we're trying to do apples to apples, trying to get the feelings out of it, just really focus on, um, on the specifics of the technical requirement. Um, for a company like us, that's, that's hard. That's hard because we we like to work in relationships and and we like to understand what our clients and prospects want to do and try to come up with the best solution together. Well, and see, that's what I'm saying is like that impersonal aspect of it comes at a cost. And the cost might right. is that context and the fuller and more complete response. Well, and it's I think that cost, to your point, there's several costs there. There could be a cost and a misunderstanding and then the dollars. There are dollars at the end because you had to fix it and get it right. There's a cost maybe in the quality, which is, okay, let's say we don't get it right, but you got something that met the letter of the law but wasn't what you wanted. There's also the cost in time, which is, okay, if you didn't understand it, the time spent to understand it, either through change orders and fixing it or through questions or whatever it might be, like there are all these costs, and that that to me is one of the things that the, that can bother me the most about RFPs. Back to what Derek said at the beginning when he was mentioning why people do them, you know, one of the thoughts is that it saves time because you get your comparison faster, you do your apples to apples, you make your decision, and you're off and running. But this impersonal nature that you just brought up, when it costs you time on the backside because oh, we didn't understand that, we understood each other differently, whatever it might be. Well, did you really save time or did you actually insert the time to understand? So to solve that, you know, sanitized, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sterile, right? Impersonal kind of communication. Did you solve that in the middle of the project when you really didn't have time instead of solving it up front? Same thing with cost, right? Right. You know? But after you set the budget, now surprise it costs right. this. Yeah. Right. Where, where do you want them? Where do you want that surprise in the beginning? Right. Or once you're fully committed. But it's counterintuitive, right? I mean, as a 
as a person, I mean, we we buy things, right, inside of Raise Relief too, right? So we we get both sides of this whole RFP process. Mm-hmm. It's not just that we respond to them, it's that we put them out also. But it's it's a question of what do you think you're accomplishing and are you pretty confident that you can accomplish that by going through this process? Or is there a better way to go through the process or some blend like RFI, RFP, that kind of thing? Yeah. That impersonal point, I think, is really important. Yeah, and, and again, it. you know, Jonathan, you made the point earlier about, you know, buying commodities, whether it's corn or pork bellies. Um, and there are things in our industry that are are somewhat commoditized. There, you know, I, I, I need a managed service contract and it's this many hours per month and I want people with this skill set available during these hours. That's, you know, right. very, very defined, very simple. Everybody treats it the same way. I just need to know your cost availability and your experience in doing that, right? So that one... So it's not to say that there aren't things that that won't work through this process. But, you know, some of the things that we're talking about is, you know, business transformational sort of stuff. <laughs> oh, right. and I want someone who I've never talked to and very sterile. And, you know, um, if, if, if I'm if I'm purchasing something that is life changing, business changing to me, I'd like to know a little bit about the person that's delivering it on the other end. Um and, and I'd like to know a little bit about their approach and their confidence and just their personality. I mean, they're going to be around me for a long time or they're going to be doing something for me, to me, with me that's significant. And so I'd like to know a little bit more about them and make sure that we, we hit it off together and that we're of the, a similar mindset. Uh, and, and these processes don't allow for that. But meanwhile, I may be inviting vendor X into my organization for the next 18 to 24 months going to spend millions of dollars with them and have 10 of their people interact with 30 of my people for the next two years. But I don't really want to talk about personality and whether we think (laughs) the same way, whether we have a culture fit. Right. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's a great point, right? Think about it in our, our personal lives, right? You, you hire somebody to like sweep out your garage. Okay. If they're doing a poor job, you don't like what they do. All right, go find somebody else to sweep out your garage. It's no big deal. You're going to hire a a nanny. You're going to go, go find a doctor. You know, something that's like, you know what? It matters if they get it wrong, if we don't work well together, if we can't communicate with each other. All those things matter. And you say, I'm going to take the time to get this that's right up right. front. Yeah. That, yeah. That's a very good summary of the the approach and some of the pitfalls, the good and the bad. So I yeah. want to I want to pay attention to, because it's my job, I want to pay attention to our time and our listeners' time here. Um, I think we've had a very good discussion. I want to kind of summarize this and then have you guys jump in and see if there's anything that I missed. Okay, so we're talking about the good, bad, and the ugly, right? Um, RFPs do allow for, at at their best, a a clear definition of scope and requirements and, and a response that, yes, we can do this, and this is the time it'll take, and this is the cost it'll take, and this is how we're going to do it. And it does allow, in theory, apples to apples comparison. Right. So it, it can save some time and money up front. Um, it's fair and transparent. Everybody is, you know, nobody gets a, a leg up because, you know, they've worked together in the past or their kids play softball together or like there's none of that. It's it's just a, a fair and transparent way to approach it. And I think I, I want to add a point to that we didn't talk about that I think is relevant is sometimes it's important that you've shown that inside the organization that's, that's running the RFP. Right, because a lot of times there's a business person mm-hmm. who's responsible for this thing, but you know, buying services, whatever it is, and their colleagues, their boss, everybody in that organization needs to know that it wasn't somebody they played softball with. Right, right. Well, so it's it's not just for purchasing or regulatory requirements. Sometimes it's just important that everybody trusts that the vendor was picked for a good reason. Right. There is there's no subterfuge. There's nothing behind right. the scenes or anything. Um, yep. But the downside of that very formal process is that it can tend to be sterile. You can, you, it's open to misinterpretation. It's open to not answering the question fully or not understanding the question fully. Um, so it, it doesn't give, while it, it allows you to compare side by side, it doesn't give the respondents any real opportunity to demonstrate why they are better other than the technology, whether it's approach, culture fit, et cetera. So, I mean, there, there's good and there's bad. Um, and it's and, and we talked a little bit about where your costs are. And you have to be co- conscious of that. Like, if you don't invest enough time up front or ask, you know, uh, allow them, if you're only focusing on the budget, you might end up finding you have a solution that 
didn't cost much up front, but ended up costing you a whole lot to implement. Yeah. What, what did I miss there? Good, bad, or ugly? I'm going to throw in ugly. Okay. Ugly is when things don't go well and you spend more time, more energy, more effort doing it multiple times. And the, the reason that can be so ugly is obviously it's a, it's a waste, it's inefficient, but you can also get to the point where there are vendors who won't reply, right? If you go through multiple iterations and you've asked them for input and, or I'm going to do an RFP and at the end, there's going to be work, right? Because everybody, everybody participating in RFP is putting in effort, right? Every vendor is. Significant and they're effort, all usually. Significant effort, right? And they're all doing it with the hope that, that they'll win the business. And if they do enough of them, they'll win enough jobs, it'll make sense. But if, if you're the kind of company who gets it wrong, doesn't go through it well, you know, finds these mistakes, and you've asked a vendor to do it multiple times, at some point they say, well, that's just, this is not worth my time. I'm not going to win this, or they're not ever going to do the work. So that's when it really can be ugly, I think. So you want to you wanna go about these things with a lot of thoughtfulness. Right. Because I, I think in that process, if you're going through multiple times as well, trying to fix the same, the initial problem that you were trying to solve, you're also running the risk of, ruining what could be good working relationships too. You know, because yep. it, it wasn't fully understood. You were, either the questions or responses were not fully understood. So there are assumptions made on both sides and you end up with bad working relationships where that really wasn't necessary. So I've got one more thing I want to add, which is not in summary, but I want to, as a parting thought for listeners, what could you do instead, right? I mean, there, there's good, and you may do an RFP and it may make sense. But if you're looking for, mm, I am concerned, are there other options? One that I want to throw out there that I've seen a couple of organizations use is instead doing a trade study, right? So if you're after the competitive nature, if you're after sort of getting everybody on board that it was a good choice, that make sure you did your, your due diligence, your homework, that kind of thing, a trade study. Lots of engineers are already familiar with this, right? That they don't, when, when you're trying to come up with a design option that's your best solution to a requirement or a problem, you go out and you study the space. And you might talk to vendors. You might talk to, you might explore it in any number of ways. And at the end of it, you're going to summarize what you learned, right? But then it's transparent. Everybody can see what you did. It might not be that you were looking for lowest price or whatnot. So again, depending on what the objective is of your RFP, just spend a minute. I'm not saying that trade studies are the answer. I'm just saying, spend a minute and think about what are we trying to accomplish and what's the vehicle to get there? Because maybe it's an RFI, maybe it's an RFP, maybe it's some other thing, but just have that in mind. And I think that helps you get through to success. Yeah. And I, I think if I had to give, you know, what to me, the one thing that, that could change in the RFP process um, is this idea of alternate proposals. Always allow vendors to submit an alternate proposal. If, if we, again, because of requirements, because of internal um, policies, um, you have to follow structure, template, fine, do that. But always give them some free form area to provide alternate ideas and alternate proposals because you're going to see things that you wouldn't, you didn't even know to ask for. And then that may change the way you evaluate the replies. And maybe there's even an RFP V2 that comes out because of some things that you learned. Thank you very much for your alternate proposal, Mr. Ford. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, I think, I think that's a, a very good, both of those are very good points to leave our listeners with. Um, particularly, like, like you said, I mean, a lot of times um, somebody has to, you have to go through an RFP. That's the way your mm -hmm. company does business. You don't have any other option. But if you can allow an opportunity for an alternative, res alternative response then you can find out if there's something out there that you didn't know you didn't know. So. All right. Well, we're going to wrap up a little bit today. Jonathan, thanks for joining me again. And uh, Derek, for, for joining Jonathan and I. Thank uh, you for having me. Your experience is duly noted in this area and very much yes. appreciated. Um, to all of our listeners, if there is a question that you had based on this podcast or any of the others, or if there's anything that you want us to to discuss or dig into a little bit in the future, please let us know. Reach out via social media, be part of the conversation. Um, and until next time, stay sharp. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being here and for listening to this episode of Stay Sharp with Razor Leaf. If you have any questions about RFPs and setting them up and preparing them or even responding to them, we'd love to have that conversation. Just leave us a comment on our post or send us an email at podcast.razorleaf.com. 
And if you like this podcast, please hit the like button and or subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform and on our YouTube channel. Until next time, stay sharp.